Turn your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 1. Now, I, uh, I, I got to tell you, I hope you're grateful for the Bible. The longer I read the Bible and the more I have the ability to go to it, the more I just am, am in wonder and awe and realize without God's word, we all would drift. And uh, it's amazing to be able to be brought back in God's Word. So let's pray right now, because uh, I believe when we open the Word of God, we are looking at God's eternal verse on paper. He is in spirit. He is running the whole universe. And this is the exact way that He can actually cut our hearts exactly where we need to be cut. He can encourage us. He divides spirit and soul, bone and marrow, he'll split your hair. It's not like I almost am going to hit what you need to hear. I'm going to hit exactly what you need to hear if you are willing to listen and open. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God, for your eternal voice on paper you've given us. Thank you so much that how, that, how we look at that and we pray and activate and we know that you're always working for us and with us, Father, for the good. God, we understand that your whole call was for us to find you. And then once we find you, to continue to realize how special it is to walk in a relationship with you. And then we realize, Father, what an incredible purpose and plan you put on our hearts collectively as your family, as your church, as the body of Christ, to realize coming together and seeking your kingdom first is an incredible purpose that keeps us alive spiritually and gives us a real meaning to life as we really wait when you decide to take us to the true life, which is after this life. Thank you so much for allowing us to be together. Please be with me, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and... Through him all things were made. Larcy, you were made through him. Even though you say, any po, any how, any ho, any who. She is the most unique. When I saw her, I go, if I was a producer, I'd definitely work on her as an actor. She's got the most unique way of delivering things. It's amazing. But she's an awesome woman of God, isn't she? Wayne. There is a God. <laughs> Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Drop down to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. You can't have one without the other. It's got to be 100% grace and 100% truth moving forward. You can't excuse yourself and not give your whole heart to God and go, I got grace, if you're not striving to love and follow the truth. 100% for both. How does a marriage work? You both give 100% to each other. One, my grandma used to say 110%. And they were married for 60 years until my grandfather passed away. I'd say, well, what you, what's the secret? She'd go, 110% to each other. Awesome. Full of grace and truth. We see here that the Word of God in the beginning was the Word. And it says the Word becomes flesh. So we see that Jesus was the walking word of God. And now God, Jesus has now died for our sins, resurrected, and ascended back into heaven. But we have the word of God, which was at the beginning anyway. And now we have the example of the word of God as flesh to understand if we can go, how does anybody know how to be right with God? How does anybody know? How do I know? That's what he was thinking when he sent him down. 
If you had a bunch of ants and you were the creator of the ants and you can continue to try to raise up ants and try to get a prophet to be an ant, an ant Moses, ant, you know, ants. And say, Aunt Moses, I need you to call these people. They're not listening. They're stubborn. And over and over and over, you try to get different ants raised up and go, God, the God that created you is trying to follow us, and they're not listening. Finally, you'd go down as an ant and show these ants the perfect way to live and have truth and grace as they walk and have a life to the full. And he still, so that's what he did for us. So now, now we're excuseless. Because we go, what would human beings, how do human beings have a relationship with God? Wow, we got it right here. What would Jesus do? The title of the lesson is, The Gift That Never Stops Giving. You know, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we know this, verse 18 through 20, all authority in heaven has been given to me, Jesus speaking. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. There's salvation right there. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. You're saved like that. All authority has been given to Jesus. And we know the Christmas season reminds us of his birth. But see, when the baby Jesus was born as a baby, it was a miracle. Emmanuel, God is among us as people. The Word became flesh. But the Word wasn't ready to do anything yet, even though God was still in control. We have an unspoken timeline of really not much about Jesus except when he becomes 12 years old in the temple. And then we see him when he starts his ministry. And that's the gift. The gift came into the world at the birth of Jesus. That's That's amazing. But if you still think of Jesus as a baby, you haven't received the gift. You don't understand what the gift is. Baby Jesus being born is a miracle, a timeline, a point in time when the final plan of God was laid out. But if you're still focusing on baby Jesus in a manger, that doesn't have any power in your life. It's exciting. It's amazing if you fall along. It's the beginning of the incredible miracle that can be done in each person's heart. But the key is the word became flesh. And the world, and in verse 10, it says here, he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. How many people today do not recognize Christ except the image in their head or an intellectual belief? That's not a gift. That's just your brain going, wow. I, I, love and fall, I love the idea of being saved and Jesus came down. That, that doesn't activate the gift. That's just knowledge, head knowledge. See, head knowledge is the start. But if you don't put the head knowledge into action, you don't, you, nothing happens. You don't, you don't activate anything. Love is action. The Bible actually says God is love. So God says for us to understand him. So let's look into this. Jesus wants all people to become disciples. He says all authority has been given to me. So when, he, when we go and, and, and understand this is a big part of the gift, the gift that never keeps giving, you're going to understand that going and, and helping others find the gift once you find the gift is the gift. Yeah. Salvation, absolutely, but that's not till you die. And it's good to know and good to know I'm saved, but if you just run around going I'm saved and do nothing, it runs out. Yeah. Even though you know it, It doesn't keep you excited enough, which is sad, but that's why we need grace, full of grace and truth. Because life goes on, it's like, well, I got to turn life. That's not enough for you anymore. You're not doing well. You're struggling. Why wouldn't that be enough? Because the plan is to understand at salvation how you live continues to fire it up. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. The gift that never gives. That never stops giving, excuse me. The gift that never stops giving. That could be the, that could be one of my points. The person that doesn't understand the gift never starts giving. In chapter 4, verse 4, we read, by the way, we did skits on campus devotional on Friday night. 
and we did Bible, we had Bible stories, and all of you guys were, I would just enjoyed it all. I see all the, all the campus students getting up there and playing out things, but Travis was uh, playing Jesus with the Samaritan woman. Poor Tia. <laughs> Tia was a Samaritan woman. He starts laying it out. Can I get a drink? Do you know who you're talking to? Blah, blah. And then she goes, well, let me go back and tell my husband. She goes, you were right, in fact. You, you've, not, you've had five husbands, not just one. One in Jacksonville, one in Gainesville, <laughs> one in Miami, one in Orlando, one in Tampa. And the one you're with right now is not your husband. And he was, you know, he was ad-libbing, but it was just, uh, it was the point. And then, then Tia went, why are you getting up all, all my business? And then she switched gears immediately. She goes, I see you're the Messiah, though, and you know everything. So it was like, it was this awesome transition. In verse 4, it's fun to make the Word of God come alive. We're not, we're not making fun of the Word. We're looking at it become alive. And then afterwards, each of the campus students had responses after the skit to really understand what are we learning. And it's incredible because they're all participating. I'm watching with Sonia and just... We're getting fed by them. It's an awesome thing. And, and in verse 4, it says, now he, had to, now he had to go through Samaria. He came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. When the Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into uh, town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. The beautiful thing about this is Jesus is introducing not only an eternal path to this woman, but an actual way to stay content regardless of outside circumstances the rest of your human life. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to get discontent, not get discontented, because we're sinners. Remember, full of grace and truth. Right. You just got to realize that grace has got to steer you back into truth. Because we're going to get bitter. We're going to get disillusioned. We're going to get ungrateful. We're going to get sad. We're going to be depressed. Yeah. The issue is, if you can get back to what he's talking about, which is the expression, actually, of, the, of in, verse, in verse 14, when he says, the water I give will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. It, you're not in eternal life. It's on the way. I have eternal life, but I'm not in eternal life. I'm living forever, but my body's going. Yep. But I've not reached heaven. I'm not in heaven. I have a promise of going to heaven as a disciple of Christ. Imagine a, spr a spring if you came up just bubbling up, a, screen, a, a, a spring of water, fresh, beautiful water just just coming up from the ground you're looking at it and it's just it's just it's vibrant it's fresh it's moving that's what he's talking about the expression is a vigorous one with a meaning like leaping up jesus was speaking of a vigorous abundant life that's what he was saying we can have as we as we follow jesus if we are following jesus once we've been saved you can have a vigorous, abundant life, even in the challenges, if you continue to understand there's nothing more important than being right with God and seeking God continuously. And when you get off track, like we all will, he came full of grace and truth. So the truth is following Jesus, really living to serve God, 
We go off the pattern. Grace is here to teach us to say no and get our attention and bring us back into the road with truth. Truth and grace need to be like this the whole time. They're, they're full, but we split them. And the grace, God knows we need it because the abundant well's now running out. The well has been stopped up. The well's looking murky. And the well starts to look like water that's sat for a while. And now it gets like a pool that turns green. You ever seen a pool that's not working anymore? And it gets all, you, can't, you get to the point where you can't even see the drain. It's completely green. You're like, oh my gosh. See, a fresh pool that's running fresh and moving, it's clear, crystal clear. But when we get into sin, that water starts to get murky. And it's not because of God's, God's truth is right here. He's saying, hey, get back in line. And, and, and the grace is supposed to get your attention and go, why aren't I welling up vigorously excited about my life? Because you're distracted and, put, and actually trusting and idol, trusting in things that we need to do. But, but you're afraid. So now instead of keeping God first, you went off the path. And now even though you're thinking that will provide for you, you're unhappy. It's the point that God's making. Come on, Chris. In John 10, just write this down, verse 10, Jesus says, I've come to give life, life to the full, full. He says, the thief comes to destroy and kill. That's Satan, the thief. But he goes, I've come to give you life, life to the full. He's talking about a full life. And you know, the older I am in the kingdom, I realize... I don't even know what to do without seeking God. I'm so grateful there's a place. I realize as an older guy, I'm done. I'm not going to go back to school probably. I don't see that happening. Uh, amen, God, who knows. But uh, yeah. what about... I'm going to let Matt warm up. He just got his master's. Matt just got his master's, so let him get in deep and everything. And I, I, follow, I follow Matt, too, as I follow Christ. Matt follows Christ. He got his master's, so I'm, you know, I'm going to... Simmer on that. <laughs> now watch me get the call next week. I need you to do that, bro, because we need to have an ICCM here. All righty. <laughs> now, the welling up, life to the full. Do you, if, you, if you should be able to be any place in life right now, even though you're trying to achieve other things and trying to grow as a person, you should still be able to go, because I'm have the priorities right with God and I'm, I became a disciple, I was baptized into Christ, my sins are forgiven, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, you should be able to get more in that life to the full zone more and more as you mature. Yeah. It'll be less and less because you're, you're saved by grace, but it's terrible to be saved by grace and feeling miserable. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? I like to be saved by grace and fired up. Yeah. And I realize coming together, the very things that we uh, struggle with are the things that God commands us to do. How you doing? All right. Make a note. I didn't touch that. It fell off by itself. I, I was here and it dropped. Amen. Point number one. Seeking the wrong treasure will let you down. Seeking the wrong treasure will let you down. Look at Matthew 6 verse 19. Now, let me ask you this as we're turning here. We rub shoulders with people every day who are desperate, hurting, and lonely. We may not even be aware of the dark road they travel. Yesterday I was talking to, uh, we got to have some lunch with wonderful Natalie's brother yeah. and his girlfriend, and he manages the, uh, the whole eye what do you call that? The whole complex, everything. I mean, no wonder he works. He works like Y360, I mean, everything. And I was just saying, man, it must just be never a dull moment. And sadly, he said, uh, there was a, uh, he said he saw a woman jump off the seven-foot parking structure right in front of him and smack. Oh, terrible. And I said, wow. I mean, gosh. You know, uh, people are hurting out there, guys. They're lonely. And many people aren't even aware how to get off the dark road they're in. They feel just completely lost. Larcy kind of shared the terrible, painful things that happened to her. We can relate to her in different ways, but we can't, we can't compare our pain to hers. But we know it was dark. It hurt. Yes. Sometimes we notice other people hurting, but often we don't. Maybe we're too busy, preoccupied, overwhelmed ourselves. 
To be honest, many days we might be those people. Desperate, hurting, and lonely, but we're in the kingdom. What do you mean? No, no, you're desperate, hurting, and lonely. You're a saved, desperate, hurting, and lonely person that needs to figure out to get the well going again. You're saved by grace, God's patient, but something's going on in your life that you're not fired up, and if you don't figure it out, that well doesn't start beaming up, you're going to fall away. Because if you read stuff that says you're supposed to have it and it doesn't come to you, then you're starting to either go, it's a lie, and Satan's going, it is. This thing, you know, they're all exact. And, you know, and, and then, you, then you'll work yourself into another pattern. You'll never say the Bible's not the word of God, but you'll be, you, you won't get it. Yep. People just need someone to notice. Yeah. To slow down. To take time actually to care and to care takes energy and effort to care says I need to stop and I need to be above board myself to be able to actually be present for someone else even though I got stuff yeah. most people think that's too overwhelming in the world they just think I'm just got me myself and I and then you know anybody immediately around me I'll try to wing it and see if I can help them that's not God's plan the Bible doesn't use the word depression by the way except in few translations it's often referenced in, in another way with other similar words like downcast, brokenhearted, troubled, miserable, despairing, mourning, among others. Throughout the word, there are a number of stories about godly, influential men and women of faith who have struggled and battled through dark times of hopelessness and depression. Many of us may find ourselves even struggling with some of that right now. Yeah. You're in church, that's real. But we don't have to stay stuck. There's hope. And that's what we're talking about, the spring welling up. You need to be walking in your salvation and growing up in your salvation. And it's a matter of trusting God. And the only fault that it is not, you're not experiencing that is you're, you don't trust God enough and you disobey. Yeah. And then you have little technicality disobedience. And you have reasons why you disobey. I'm just telling you, we're going to look at that. You're going to be blown away. The whole answer is very simple. It's a very simple formula. It's unbelievable how simple it is. But we all have stepped out of it, myself included. Yeah. Let's look at uh, Matthew 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vernon, vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Drop down to verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We see here that there's a great treasure that the Lord, that Jesus says, store up while you're on earth living, store up in heaven your treasure. Well, how do you store up heavenly treasure while you're living as a human being on earth? Follow Jesus. Everything else you know you need, God knows you need. But it's not the same perspective. It's not the end all, the end all. You, when you start to become more mature spiritually, your treasures aren't in material anymore. Doesn't mean you don't like stuff, but it's just not as important. And when it's not as important, it's like almost like things come anyway, and you go, oh, I'll just use this to help people get right with God. Oh, I'll just use this to help people get right with God. Oh, this is another platform I've got. And people go, how do you, no, because you don't care about it. You use it, and God knows you need it, but you just understand it's not the important focus. Your career, your retirement on earth is not your important focus as a disciple. Doesn't mean you don't be wise, but God says there's no retirement. You don't retire, you die, and either you go to heaven or hell. Come on, guys. Amen. And even in heaven, I don't believe we retire, it's kind of boring. That's why even in retirement homes, people, just, if they retire on their own in a little home, I mean a little place by themselves, they die quickly. If a spouse dies that's elderly and the other spouse is left and have God first, they, they die of a broken heart because all their eggs were in that spouse. Yeah. They got to have God first even when a tragedy, painful thing happens like your mate of 50 years dies. If you have God first, the, first, the design is yes, you'll miss them. But there's nothing like if you're both right with God, you're still going to work through that and go, wow, amen. Yeah. I really appreciated that time. I know she's in heaven or he's in heaven. 
but you realize you'll still go on with joy, not just like, like now what do I do? Because you're with God. <laughs> Treasures in heaven are doing the will of God. When you do the will of God, so to speak, it's like a cash register in heaven going ching, 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 ching. It's not money value, but you're building up a treasure in heaven. You're living for people. You're loving and depositing and giving of yourself because what does God want? God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son to save us. He wants to save us. So once we're saved, the welling spring now is looking to others more important than yourself. To be willing to get close enough to God and trust that you're not afraid and you actually can put yourself out there with others. And it, it may be tiring, but it's awesome. The life of a disciple is not necessarily a comfortable life, but it's an awesome life. Amen. And let me tell you something. Try sitting in comfort more than you really should. You're miserable. That's right. Just, you know, idle, not working the way you need to do, got all the time in the world, you're just laying around, waking up at any time. Oh my gosh, you're miserable Come on. if you don't have something to do. Turn your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Is the well of water vigorously and abundantly fueling you in a life to the full? I realized last night, in the, in the, in, when I'm with disciples wherever I'm at, but when we're together, I realized, man, what would I be doing if I wasn't a Christian? How many friends would I really have? I'd probably move for work because that's the priority. So you really wouldn't have much people. And anywhere I live, when I see non-Christians, they live in my neighborhood or wherever. They're nice people. But you can see they don't extend themselves very far because they don't know. Right. They kind of take, they make friends maybe in co-work. They have a little, they get a connection in the, as a co-worker. But if they, one gets fired or one leaves, that friendship kind of patties out. Yeah. So it's always really what, what kind of you meet by coincidence. Neighbors say hi, and sometimes they'll actually give you a lawnmower like our next-door neighbor, which is awesome. He's, that was very unusual, but he, <laughs> he tried to fix our lawnmower. It didn't work. He goes, here, I got an extra one. You guys can use it. He's, I'm praying for him. He's awesome. Reminds me of a Terry Tate in Burbank we converted. I don't know how it's going to happen yet, but we're already connected talking. Um, in verse uh, 2, it says, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Could you imagine someone just saying that in the morning? You're meaningless. It sounds bitter and just out there. <laughs> Say you just got with someone. How are you feeling? Everything's meaningless. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything's meaningless. Doesn't, why, why try anything? You're like, whoa. Oh. But now let's keep going. <laughs> what do people gain from all their labors? And, what, and which, at which they toil under the sun? Well, I answer that question. It's funny. It's like a profound question. What do you gain? Well, I got a bank account. can pay my rent. Uh, I can live and exist till I'm old and then when I die. Okay? Well, if you just gain that, what did you get? If you don't have God, what do you got? Just worked your hard to the bone. Just make sure you have shelter, clothes, and food. We all want that, but God's saying that's not the answer. Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. We can look at pictures. We can hear our parents and our grandparents tell stories, and we can go, wow. We can even look at pictures of relatives we never met, and we look at the time period and the clothes, and we go, whoa, but they're gone. The sun rises, sun sets, hurries back to where it rises. Unbelievable. If you ever went to a foreign country, I've been on the other side of the world, and you look at the sun going up, and you go, wow, that's the same sun as over here. Yeah. Same moon. Yeah. That's been going on for thousands of years, guys. Amazing. The wind blows to the south, turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, they, ne they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, and the, nor the ear, it's fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, there's something new. It is already, it was here already long ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the form, former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. I, the teacher, was a king over Israel. In Jerusalem, I applied my mind to study and explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. 
What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Now, just think about how God makes it so ridiculously pathetic if you think about him trying to reason with you. He's reasoning with you, and he makes the choices. Choice number one, find me. Choice number two, meaningless, 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 no matter what you do. Yep. Choice number one, abundant, vigorous life to the full, and then die and be with me in heaven. Choice number two, chasing after the wind. Chase the wind. Try it. I want to see someone chase the wind. I, I, I mean, I could run all over. The, I'm running through wind right now. Or maybe it's got to get windy. But imagine someone out there, you'd think they're nuts. You're running and trying to just grab the wind over and over. I can't grab no wind. He says it's a, you're, you're, you're insane. It, actually, that's what he's saying. It's insanity to live like the human world tells you to live. You're insane. Yep. You know, there's a famous song called The Piano Man by Billy Joe. Many of you probably know it, but the more I'm looking at this song, the more profound it is. It's a really well-known song. Maybe some of you people, you younger ones, are going, what is it? Look it up, you'll see how powerfully known it is. He's singing about a festive piano bar that people come into. And it seemingly seems like they're all happy when they come in and they see each other again, but they really only see each other in the bar. So they have rapport and they're happy and they're coming looking for something. But as it goes on in the song, it breaks down the reality of how sad the human situation of each one of these people is. Even the piano man. The piano man who plays and, and he says things, it says it. So here's a lyric. It's nine o'clock on a Saturday. Regular crowd shuffles in. There's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and Jen. He says, son, can you play me a memory? I'm not really sure how it goes, but it's sad and it's sweet, and I knew it complete when I wore a younger man's clothes. Then it goes, la di da di di da la la di di da 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 Sing us a song, you're the piano man. Sing us a song tonight. Well, we're all in the mood for a melody, because you got us feeling all right. Now, it says here, it's 9 o'clock, the crowd comes in. Here's the first scenario as we look at Ecclesiastes. Oh, this is Ecclesiastes in the human condition. There's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and gin. His, his, his most important relationship is alcohol, yet he's got to be around people. So he's there, and he comes in, he's deceived, he's idle, and he's an old man. So basically, what's it come down to? An old man alone in a bar, making love to his drink, just getting that drink in front of him. But he, but he has fellowship somewhat, he thinks. It's not really fellowship, it's, it's people around him, but it's the only place he feels safe or feels like he's pulled in. But it's a lie, because they leave and they know no one. Yeah. And it says, he says, can you play me a memory? I'm not sure where it goes. It's sad and it's sweet, and I knew it complete, but it was only I knew it when I wore a younger man's clothes. So his life is just run by, mm -hmm. empty and old. Yeah. The next one says, now John at the bar is a friend of mine. He gets me my drinks for free. And he's quick with a joke or to light up a smoke. But there's some place that he'd rather be. He says, Bill, I believe this is killing me, as a smile ran away from his face. Well, I'm sure that I could be a movie star if I could get out of this place. la di da di -de da <laughs> But you see the regrets of this guy. But he's Mr. Happy Joe Go Lucky. Everything's fine. He's quick with a joke. He's Mr. Wonderful. And then that one moment of vulnerability, the piano man, because they're all sitting around the piano man, so he seems like their best trusted friend, but they don't have each other's numbers. They don't hang out outside of the bar. They just feel so close to the piano man because they can come in and go, hey, he's, hey, but he's just there as they tip him. And he says, you know, he starts to want, cry about his regrets of life. He didn't go after anything. He didn't do what he wanted to do. He felt stuck and imprisoned by life. Whether it doesn't matter what you want to do, he just regrets. 
And then you look around the bar and he continues to go on. He says, and the waitresses are practicing politics as the businessmen slowly get stoned. Yes, they're sharing a drink they call loneliness, but it's better than drinking alone. The waitresses, not just waitresses, but everybody out there that doesn't really even have the total information, everybody just has opinions. And everybody's talking and about a bunch of stuff, but not, you know, big, strong, strong opinions on politics, and they're practicing politics, and I would do this and that, but they've never done anything themselves. Yeah. And then the businessmen, even though they may be successful, they're still not content. They've got to get wasted. So the businessmen are slowly getting stoned because even though they've achieved something, they're missing something. It's, it's not enough. And then they're all together sharing a drink called loneliness. So they're all together. And the real exposure is they're all really lonely, but they're all together. La -di -da, da -di -da, da -di -da. So it's actually they're fake. Like we're having a good time. Yeah. But they're all sharing loneliness. A drink called loneliness because it's better than drinking alone. So it's better than being alone all the time just to come out and get a little high on some alcohol and believe and be faked out that you have a little group of family which after they leave the bar and the next day no one knows anybody yeah. i did that for years i used to go to clubs and places make new friends be talking up a storm quick with a joke light up a smoke how you doing leave and just never ever connect deep yeah. and then the piano man gets to himself or actually, no, it actually says next, it says, now Paul is a real estate novelist who never had time for a wife. And he's talking with Davy, who's still in the Navy and probably will be for life. The interesting thing on this is Paul's a real estate novelist. I don't even know what a real estate novelist is. I know what a real estate agent is, but it sounds pretty, what do you do? I'm a real estate novelist. You could just put novelist on anything. It's not important. I'm a, uh, yeah, there you go. You'll get people's attention. But it says he never had time for a wife, yet he's sitting at the bar for long hours of time, ended up, he's ended up this way. He never had time for a wife because he's cranking his career. Now he's alone, and his best friend's this guy named Davey who's still in the Navy. And probably we will be for life. So the, 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 the irony of it is that he could have had time for a life for the fall, he never had time for a wife because he looked for his career and his idols, the most important. Now he's getting older, he's got time, lots of time, and the only place he can have fellowship is he finds local people and just connects with them that night on booze. Yeah. He's talking with Davey, who's still in the Navy, and probably be, will be for life, and they probably got an in-depth conversation and had drink after drink, and blah, 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 blah. then they left, hey man, great meeting you too, great meeting you up to get together again, they don't do it. Then he sums it up. It's a pretty good crowd for a Saturday. And the manager gives me a smile because he knows it's me they've been coming to see to forget about life for a while. And the piano sounds like a carnival and the microphone smells like a beer. And they sit at the bar and put bread in my jar and say, man, what are you doing here? La -da 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 -da. So even the piano man had dreams and he's still at the very small little corner bar and he's, he's the star there. And all they talk is like, what are you doing still doing here? He never got out. I'm just telling you, life can suck you in and you can miss the real meaning of it in many ways. Many of us don't even follow our dreams because we're afraid. Fear is a killer. Look at... Point number two is obey, obeying, obeying the two greatest commandments will give you real purpose in life. Amen. It's very simple. It's very simple. Most people would, would even can quote the greatest, two greatest commandments. Can someone in here tell me what the two greatest commandments are? All right, this is the thing. Knowing them is one thing, but here's the secret to success right here. And, 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 and the secret of being deceived is, needs to be revealed Come on. in verse 36 it says teacher which is the greatest commandment of the law jesus replied love the lord your god with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest command and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself all the law and prophets hang on these two commandments 
Do you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? And before you nod your head and say yes, you got to understand what that entails. you got to understand what does it mean from God's point of view to be loved, not your thought process of what you think God loves. Right. Just like if you were interested in pursuing a relationship with someone, I needed to find out what Sonia loves. Now, she's got to love me. Because I can't, I got to be me. It ain't easy being green. I got to be me. But I also got to be, you know, as a woman of God, when we start dating in the kingdom, she was looking for godly qualities. So hopefully she was seeing encouragement and out of myself, not just with her. I wasn't just on my uh, best behavior when she was around. Well, there's Sonia. Hey, how you doing? Hey, hey, hey. Let me move that chair for you. You need any help, bro? No, no. When Sonia wasn't there, or I didn't know she was there, she saw me not with her in church. She saw me dealing and talking and interacting with people. Amen. She saw me going with whoever was saying, hey, can you get in this study and help me? This guy wants to know the Bible. Yeah. And I'm walking, knowing nothing, because I'm a brand new disciple. So, you know, I'm just, yeah, 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 I'm in there, I'm in there, whatever it takes. No, 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 I can't get, she, but she, she's doing the same thing, so she never even asked me if we could have lunch together. She's with the women. Amen. Why? Wow, is that a rule? They make you do that? Yes, they do. <laughs> If you come into this church, you can never go to lunch with your boyfriend or girlfriend. I'm just kidding. I understand the process. I planned my date with my wife, with my girlfriend at that time. I understand on Sunday it's game day for God Almighty. And I love God more than Sonia with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I still love God more than Sonia with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And she's amen, amen in that. Because she benefits. <laughs> and when you love your once you love God first and then you love your neighbor as yourself, you can't do it without loving God. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself without going to God and learning and asking God to help you love. Right. You can't do it. You'll run out of steam. It's not a natural human instinct. It's not process. It's not something natural you want to do. It's inconvenient. Why would I do that? No one, I, I, I got got my own problems, Charlie. And I said again in John 3, 16, God so loved the world, he, wanted, he gave his only begotten son to, because he wants us to be saved. So God's love is loving others. The Bible in John chapter 14, verse 23 says, if you obey me, you love me. Anyone who obeys me and my teachings loves God. If you don't obey me and my teachings, you do not love God. Obedience tells God you love him. Amen. And not only obedience when you feel like it. Right. That means selfishness tells God you don't love him. Or you're trying, you want to, you just, I'm sorry, I can't. There's no such thing as can't in God's kingdom. What are you, where are you from? It's either I will or I won't. And if you say, I will, and I don't feel like it, then you get on your knees and start going, God Almighty, help me to love like I never understood. Help me to have a willingness to deny myself and get with anyone to help. Now you're, all, now you're walking the plane of the spring, starting to find that spring that's bubbling. Yes. But see, now you've got to be equipped, too, because see, if you don't love God with all your heart, then you don't love God's word. And if you're not reading God's word, because it's, it's not like a to-do list, like I just got to get my check mark just to make sure I get enough energy to go today. No, you're soaking up God's word, because you know wisdom and discernment's coming in your brain. And you're becoming more wise every day as you work the word of God and study out nuggets. And, and now when you talk, the word of God that went into your brain churns all the way up and comes out in layman's terms and all different ways and wisdom. And they're going, whoa, that dude's so relatable. Well, I can relate to him. Let's get together. And I just spoke like 45 verses into him in my own layman's term. He didn't even know the Bible was spoken, but it was. Yeah. Then we get in the Bible. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> or he'll say something. I go, bro, you just said what the Bible says. Did you know that? He'll go, because I know the Bible. Yeah. And he'll go, really? I go, let me show you. You just said it in your own words, but this is what you said. Look at this. Isn't that interesting? Wow. But see, if you don't love God's word with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then you're not growing as a scholar of God. Wait a minute. I didn't know I needed to be a scholar. I thought the ministry needed to be a scholar. No, no. You need to be a disciple of Jesus. All authority is in him. How are you going to move anybody without the power of God's knowledge and word in your, in your heart? And, and you've got to know what you're doing. 
So you just got to be studying it, but you got to go, do I love God's word? And stop going by your feelings. If I could rip all your feelings out of you, where you had no emotions anymore, I would. Because then you would just do what the Bible says. But God said, no, I need you to have free will, and I need you to learn that emotions are dangerous, even though they're good. They're also very dangerously bad. So now you have to distinguish good from bad on your own and be willing to man or woman up and deny yourself. If you want to love God with all your heart, so mind and strength. That's right, Chris. Come on. John, 1 John 4, 1, 1 through 4. 1 John 5, 1 through 4. Excuse me. We're coming in for the landing. Come on, Chris. You guys fired up? Yeah. There's an old man sitting next to me making love to his tonic and gin. That's so pathetic. Isn't that? Don't be critical of him. Before you found God, you were making love to something. That's worshiping. We all worship something. Well, you're going to worship God or you're going to worship something else. And that's what you're saying you love. So if work is, is your God, that's your God. If you fall somewhere around, you'll know who you love or what you... We're all built to worship. Everybody, you can go to everybody in the street. You want to start a good Bible talk? Go, you're built to worship. You worship something. No, I don't. I'm not even religious. No, no, you worship something. And you start getting your life, oh, you worship your job. Yeah. You worship your car. Oh, you worship your muscles. Because that's, you, that, that's your most important thing. Right. See what I'm saying? Whatever we're, whatever's most important to us once it breaks down, that's what we worship. We're, we're built to worship God, but we're going to find something else to worship, which is idolatry. But we're built to worship. You're going to worship drugs, women, Cars, material, advancement, education. You're going to worship even good, good things in and of themselves. You'll worship. But if you put that before God, you've just messed the whole deal up. Yeah. First John. Chapter 5. Verse 1. Everyone who believes that Christ, that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father... Loves his child as well. Let me just make a present. Someone can read this that's not a disciple and go, see, I believe. No, no, you got to take it in context. When you believe in Jesus, you go back in Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Baptism was never an issue in, the old, in, 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 that, in those days. Today, it's a concept that Satan's throwing out there and mixes people up that have a form of godliness but are too prideful to admit they didn't receive the forgiveness of their sins because they won't leave the church they went to all their life if their church teaches wrong doctrine because it's too sentimental or they know everybody there. And I know that's hard, but whatever, you got to follow the truth. Yeah. Verse 2 says, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Wow, carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Let me ask you this, guys. And let's just be honest. His commands, you've felt like they're burdensome before. Right? As disciples, really good-hearted disciples. You got out of the waters of baptism, you, that water was welling up for a good amount of time. You're fired up, you're being positioned, Someone's there, your name's being mentioned, you're a good, fired up disciple, you might even be a leader. And then something didn't work out, you got put aside. And then your heart was exposed because you're not being recognized or I'm not being, now you pull back. Guess what just happened? It became burdensome. But it always was burdensome because you were deceived. You were going for selfish ambition in the kingdom. You, you were going for God because you felt great about the way it's going. But then when it didn't go your way, you stopped fully obeying God. See what I'm saying? Burdensome. If it's a burden, just look in your heart. Remember, grace and truth. You're supposed to be together. I'm feeling burdened. Okay, you're starting to swerve off the highway. Grace is still, truth is still holding the line. But grace is, you're going over the desert now off the road. You're on bumps. Bum, 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 bum. Grace is still with you. The truth is right here. Get back. Get back over here. You're like, oh, I don't want to. I don't want to. It's burdensome. Then you start realizing, wow, people start to really get in your life. And you go, I'm not obeying the word of God. I, I need to repent here and there. They're little pet sins, though. They're like little chihuahua sins. And that, that, you, that you, just, you somehow summarize that it's not a bad sin. And you, you somehow accepted it as a pet sin. So now it's like a little... 
It's just like it's not that terrible a sin, but you're not dealing with it. And it's just as deadly as any other sin. And once you kick it out and repent of it, you start to move back toward off the bumpy road onto, onto truth again with grace. And grace brings you back in because grace is with you, even though you're miserable and burdened. Seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and everything will be given to me. I know. Where were you? Why do you keep calling me? And get over in truth and then you'll be fired up and realize it's an honor to be here. Old age, God's plan. Final point, seeking God's kingdom gives real meaning. Okay, all right. I got to figure out what to do now. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Come on, Chris. If you're full of grace and truth, then when you're struggling, you'll get back in the truth because you'll allow the grace to bring you back into repentance. If you don't, you're going to be miserable. You're going to be hanging on, but not joyful, unproductive, and not useful to God. And God and us that are back more in grace and see it, we're going to be all willing to help because that's what we do for each other, right? But you poor you, you're just miserable. You got a grumpy look on your face and you're moping. And the real issue is you're not fully obeying the Lord again. Loving God with all your heart means I'm going to love people with all my heart. And I'm going to learn to love all people. And that's, that's the blessing. That's the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Before the days of trouble come. And the years approach where you will say I find no pleasure in them. See without God, old age, you can find no pleasure in it. With God, it's awesome. Every crink, every pain, every ow, every noise getting up and down. I make noises when I get up, and I make noises when I get down. <laughs> Usually. My knee's crippled right now. I need two knee replacements. I would be going, ah, uh, and now I go, wow, I'm just wearing out, man. God's awesome, though. This is, I love the age process. Let the grays come. Come on. <laughs> but see... It means act decisively on God's behalf while you're young. That's what it means in the Hebrew. Remember the Creator in the days of your youth means act decisively on God's behalf while you're young. It's better to find God so you don't waste most of your life on wrong purposes. Yeah. And, you're and you can still get in, but you've got a lot of baggage. Yeah. And then it goes through the sun and the light, the moon and the stars grow dark. The clouds return, the clouds return after the rain. See, that's chasing the wind. The next big thing you pursue, the new job, the promotion, the new car, the new girlfriend, the new wife in the world's eyes, the new this, that, and the other thing gives you a momentary time of euphoria. Yeah. But then, see, the clouds return after the rain, which means it wears off and now it's depressing time again. You're not, you've lost, it fizzled out. Now what? What's the next thing? I'm not happy again. You have to keep finding something to fill yourself up. Yeah. Yeah. And it never has lasting, staying power for contentment. It's got to be the next thing. I need something else. Where is it? Yeah. When the keepers of the house and the strong men stoop and the grinders cease because they're few and those looking through the windows grow dim in verse 3, that means, you know, you get a little older. You start to, you know, stoop. If I don't bend my back up in the morning, I'm, uh, it's a little tight. I got I to kind of go. But as you get older, you'll notice it's not, it's not any disrespect. It's just, it's just, it's just you, you know it. Yeah. We're going to all be there, guys. That's the yeah. process of God. Right. Grinders cease. They didn't have dentures back then. Eventually, your teeth either grind down or you fall out, and then, you know, you're gumming your food. That's the way it was back then. Yeah. And then it says those looking through the windows grow dim. You don't have these. You had a magnifying glass. That was the first thing back in the 1700s. You, you know, you'd look at something. And you rise up to the sound of birds and they grow faint. So the littlest thing will wake you up and it's so hard to get back to sleep because you're aching and in pain. That's why old people need as much sleep as younger people. It's just harder to sleep when you're older. It's just true. I read a study on it. It's hard for me too. Remember. But then it says here, People are afraid of heights in, in verse 5 and the dangers in the streets and the almond blossom tr tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire is no longer stirred. If you fly over uh, almond trees, when they're blossoming, they're silver. Yeah. They're completely silver. So naturally, we just start to age. Yep. 
The grasshopper drags itself along. Have you ever seen a grasshopper, a big grasshopper? Do they have big grasshoppers here? Yes. We have big ones. If you find it in the morning in the winter where it's really cold and you see it in the grass, I used to see them in Arizona, they just, they're moving a little slower in the coldness. They just, they move, they, you know, they just kind of move slower until they get warmer and then they can move. It's a grasshopper. When you're older, when you get up in the morning and you're older, your aches and pains, you kind of just got to, you know, you don't just jump out of bed and start dancing. You got to kind of work things out. You know, I'm like b between here and after my knees, which is hard to get on my knees at the beginning, but I go, God, I'm more pain nor gain. Then I walk out to the kitchen with the cereal or the whatever it is I'm doing. And, you know, I'm still trying to work things out and I'm, you know, the honey. And I'm like, this. not that honey. The honey. Um, <laughs> hope it doesn't. <laughs> so now, and then it says desire is no longer stirred. You know what that means? Yep. Sex drive leaves. It's just life. It's it's so amazing. This was written like six, like five thousand years ago, yep. and he's writing the, the, the age thing. And then it says, "Remember him before the silver cord is severed, the golden bowl is broken before the pitcher is shattered in the spring." The wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to God it gave up. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Everything is meaningless. Yeah. And then he ends up with a very powerful truth that's still as profound as the day God created the world. Yeah. In verse 13, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the duty of all mankind. For God will judge every deed, bring every deed into judgment, including everything, whether it, it, every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. See, it's not hidden from them. You just think you're hiding it. See, to come into the light is get right with God. He sees everything, but you've hid it until judgment, and then he's given you all that grace to come forward and confess and repent. It's going to be exposed. It says in Romans, I'm going to judge. This is what happened when, when people's secrets are judged by, through Jesus Christ in Romans. Any secret or any, anything you haven't brought forward, you can go to the grave with it. God already has it filed, but the heart approach to it, you're not saved because you held it in and you didn't repent. God sees it hidden. He wants you to bring it out. That's humility and repent. You can't repent if you don't bring it out. You can't repent if you don't change it, right? Yeah. So, on, you want to be bubbly this summer? I mean, this, this Christmas, bubble up, spring, welling up. I know for me now, when I'm not, when I'm not feeling it, and if I'm feeling mopey or, or, or cranky or tired, I go, what's going on with the well? Because I'm saved, but I ain't there yet. Why aren't I joyful now? Well, I need to pray, and then I need to push through my moods and my emotions. And I need to and get back on point of God is with me. And God wants me to be welling up right now in a vigorous life to the full. So then I go, God, and after some prayer and thinking through, I'm bringing back in the joy. Because it's not that hard. It's just a willingness. Right. So your eternal life is given to you by grace. Yep. You want to keep your eternal life? Then keep welling up and obey God with all your heart and love people like people naturally don't know how to do. And that means you build and connect and then save souls that are open. To yep. God be the glory. Amen. Amen.